The Secret Library Podcast is brought to you by the incredible members of the podcast Patreon. As we come to the last few episodes of season two of The Secret Library, remember the show doesn't have to stop for you between seasons. The show's Patreon is still hopping with monthly solo episodes, the chance to submit for Q&A sessions, and while we're all still at home, monthly group gatherings to check in about our writing. You can learn more and sign up at patreon.com slash secret library. The next draft course launches today. I'm so excited to share this with you. I've been hard at work creating the most comprehensive overview of my revision and rewrite process over the past number of months, pulling together all I've learned from living and breathing revision throughout this season and working on my own book. If you want to join the adventure today, you can learn more and sign up at a discounted price that goes through May 15th at nextdraftcourse.com. This is the Secret Library Podcast. My guest this week is Simon Van Bui. Simon is the award-winning and best-selling author of 13 books, which include The Secret Lives of People in Love, which was shortlisted for the Vilsack Prize, Love Begins in Winter, which was awarded the Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award, Everything Beautiful Began After, The Illusion of Separateness, Tales of Accidental Genius, Father's Day, The Sadness of Beautiful Things, which was shortlisted for the Edge Hill Short Story Prize, two novels for children entitled Gertie Milk and the Keeper of Lost Things and Gertie Milk and the Great Keeper Rescue, along with three anthologies of philosophy, Why We Fight, Why Our Decisions Don't Matter, and Why We Need Love. Simon was on the show once before, which is how we met. Throughout 2019, I worked with Simon as my editor and mentor, something that many listeners have asked me about numerous times. I knew this season on revision wouldn't be complete without a second conversation with Simon. This is especially true since as we speak, I am in the second half of my rewrite, which will be going back to Simon in mid-May. If you're curious about working with an editor and what collaboration feels like, I know this episode will help. So I'm delighted to introduce once again, Simon Van Bui. Hey, Simon, thank you so much for coming back on the show. You're very welcome. It's a pleasure. Yeah, so I know everyone has been curious about, I've talked about working with a mentor and an editor for the past year, and we've had so many conversations about revision and about what's working in a book and what's not working. It just seemed necessary that you come back and we share a little bit of that um, as much as we can with the show. Sounds like a great idea. Thanks. And um, one of the things that I found really helpful when we were talking about the structure of the book over the course of the last year was really what you need to handle in sort of the initial foundation draft, and then what you think about once that draft is finished as you go into the revision process. So I'm wondering if you could share some of your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think the first thing, you know, after the initial drafting process is... um, is don't be afraid. Because on the one hand, you know, most people never ever get to a final draft. Um, You know, they might get three quarters of the way through, or they might get a quarter of the way through a book, which is almost, you know, the sentences are good, the structure is good, but they just can't actually make it over to over that last hill to a final draft. And and when you do, a part of you thinks, well, it's done, I finished the book. But then you soon realize that you finish the, the the draft, but you absolutely haven't finished the book, and there's going to be quite a lot more. Not in terms of um, not in terms of writing time, but more you know editing and revising. And it's where the magic happens, actually. I think. I love that, and I'm wondering, what do you think it is that stops people at that point when they're getting over that last hill, like they're they're coming to the end, and then there's this last push to get through it, which I definitely experienced. And what do you think stops them from from getting to the other side of that? Definitely fear, but not fear of failure, but I think fear of success. Because the thing is, once you, once you do what you set out to do, you're in this sort of limbo, a kind of creative purgatory. So I think a lot of people 
are very afraid of um, of finishing something because then what what comes next? Um, and also the idea that um, you know you had this preconceived idea of you finished the book. Why is it finished? Because it's the best you can do. But then. If it's not finished, but it's the best you can do, where do you go from there? How do you turn it into something which, you know, might even be, you know, commercially viable? Um, so I think it, there's a really a lot of fear with finishing a book and a project. Definitely. I think it's like the idea of what the book would be in your head and what is there on the page at the end of a first draft are not really the same thing at all. <laughs> Absolutely. It's sort of like having a teenager in a way, because, you know, when, <laughs> when children are young, it's like you can mold them into these like little yous and, oh, what, you love Fred Astaire as well? That's amazing. Me too. Um, you know, and you can, you can take them out and buy them clothes and they're, they're generally amenable, you know, as long as there's candy involved or like, you know, a ride on a car in a carnival, something like that. But when they become teenagers, and they start to just strike down your ideas, you know, with like these well-directed like sentences, like missiles, you know. And then you realize, huh, um, it's still, you know, it's my child, but it doesn't, it's not behaving the way that I want it to anymore. And anyone who has a teenager will know that you're in this kind of weird limbo where you don't know what they're going to do next or what they're going to say or how they're going to feel. All you know is that you're committed to them and that you love them. So, it's a, it's a, you're really just sort of driving in fog. You could only see so far ahead and you just have to use faith that you're eventually going to get to where you need to be. Um, and so I think that having a te entering the teenage years with a child is very similar to having a completed first draft of a book. The rules have changed now because the book is actually, it's alive. It's its own thing. So if you've got a teenager out in your hands, how do you create magic when you go back through to revise it? Um, well, first of all, you create boundaries where um, you don't allow yourself to judge the work when you're not actually sitting down to work on it. Because when you're working, when you're editing... You are, you know, like a con an art conservator. You have the gloves on. You have, like, you know, the radio on in the background, a cup of tea. You know, the, the, it's, it's, a, it's a particular atmosphere. And, you know, it might seem silly to be restoring a painting of somebody's hand from the 1500s, you know, in light of what's happening in the world. But in that moment when you're doing it, that, you know, restoring that hand is the most important possible thing you can do. You know, you really feel like it's it's just a vital operation. And so when you're sitting down to work on, on the first draft, you need to feel like this is, you're working on the hand. It's really the most important thing that needs to be done. And then when you're not, when you're driving to the supermarket or you're on the train or you're at, you know, your regular job, don't judge your work in those moments because you have a different head on. You have your kind of world practical head. And the thing is, when the book is finished, you will judge it in, at any time, as people will, in bookshops and editors and things like that. But when it's at this cru crucial stage where it's not yet developed, it's a finished book, but it's not a finished book. You need to be very gentle with it and have boundaries with yourself. Because a lot of people I've found, they will lose, um, you know, they'll finish the book and they'll have it sitting there on their desks. And then they'll leaf through it before they go to bed and they'll be like, oh, there's a typo. Oh, I don't like that sentence. And very quickly, your faith in the project starts to erode. So lock it up. Don't even get it out until you are, you've got five hours ahead of you where you can sit down and actually work on it. I think that makes sense because it's very easy to feel doubtful or to think, oh, is this really working? Mm. Or is this, is this right? Or I don't know when yeah. you're out wandering around. Right. And before you finish the first draft, that's okay because, you know, you're like, well, it's not finished yet. It's not finished yet. But then when it is finished and you're going back to the beginning, and also if it took you a year, say, to write the first draft, you have to realize that you're a much better writer now than you were a year ago because you've been practicing, you've been reading. Um, you know, it's like when you look at a picture when you're 16 and you look at a picture of yourself at 10 
there's a certain amount of curiosity and disgust. You're like, oh, that was me. Look what I was wearing. Oh, look at my hair. You know. Right. But in order for you to become the 16 year old you are now, you had to go through that stage. You know, it's all like a, it's it's all like stepping stone. So when you have the, the finished draft, you have to be really mindful that it's it looks like an adult, but it's actually very much a fragile, you know. Uh, com- um, undeveloped person in a way, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. It's like it's they're tall like adults, but they still have very sensitive yeah. feelings. Hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. And um, and and also they've only got you know if you think about a child, a fifteen year old only has really like ten less than 10 years experience of the world because you know up until you're five you don't really you're just sort of fumbling around but um so a first draft is very much like that it seems like it's a book you know like you're going to march off to the to the edit to the publishers with it but actually no it's it's unformed it's still in the in the building stage um you know if you've ever seen a house getting getting um constructed you know when you get to a certain point where the pipes are in the you know the drywall is in and maybe the electrics have been put in and from the outside it looks like you know a house but when you go in it's completely bare it's a concrete slab it's cold you know there's even gaps in windows and things like that and you realize wow this is this is completely not habitable but from the outside it looks pretty much the same as a year from then when it is going to be inhabit- habitable. So when you get to that stage, when you get to the end of a draft of the book you're working on and you've got your gangly teenager kind of partially formed house, where do you start when you go back in to start filling in the gaps and making it the finished book that it will be? Uh, well, I always start it back at the beginning uh, and this might be something I'd worked on a year before. Um, and because you didn't, you, because now you go back to the beginning of the book, um, but you hadn't written the rest of the book when you'd written the beginning. So what's going to happen is the beginning will be the biggest learning curve because you will be changing things, you know, based on how the book ended you know, putting in foreshadowing and, you know, putting in little things for, for the characters so that later on, you know, like hiding the doll in the cupboard so that in chapter seven, when you know the person opens the cupboard and they get hit on the head by the doll, that's a nice. And then so in chapter one, we put the doll in the cupboard. So you're doing all these things which really feel quite labor intensive. It's a lot of uh, grafting. But as you get further through the first draft, it gets less and less because you get closer to the point where you finished. So it's really, it's really difficult when you finish the draft and you go back to the beginning and start editing because it feels really elemental in a way. And it's really discouraging. So you just have to battle through and, you know, always tell yourself that you're serving the book. You're not serving yourself. Almost like, you know, a factory worker who, you know, makes, assembles machines. You just clock in, assemble the machine and go home and have tea. So you have to think of it like that, you know, sit down for however many hours you do a day, you know, clock in, um, work on it. And some days will be harder than others and then clock out and don't think about it until you sit down again the next day. I find that so difficult to walk away from yeah, it's it fully. Difficult. It's always in there. It's always yeah. lingering around. It's like, well, was that the best way to yeah. handle that? Was that the best point? Could I have done that better? Is that really, is that really right? Yeah. Mm. I'm supposed to be like having yeah. a little pause right now before I go back in. And I'm thinking about it every day, every day, all the time. Yeah. That's fine. Just don't look at it is my advice. Don't, don't open the document and look at it because, you know, you'll immediately start to find things that are wrong with it. And now on the one hand, that's good because it means that if there's something wrong with it, you're going to try and fix it. You know, so that's actually going to work for you in the long run. But in the short term, it's a confidence destroyer. You know, and so that that strange um, sort of uh, blend of self-doubt and also confidence is where, you know, the work really flourishes. 
Yeah, I think you have to trust that it's going to turn into something ultimately, that there's somewhere that yes. it's going. I mean, I think that's sort of the, the, the tricky thing because it was, I think, different to what many people experience for me to have someone who was looking at my pages throughout the year. I mean, my husband hasn't seen one word of this book, and um, but but you've seen all of it. So it's, it's just interesting, yeah. I think, for people to hear what it's like to send your work out. Of course, it was terrifying for me. The first time I did, I was like, oh, God, <laughs> get this message back. That's like, you know, I th- that's great and everything, but I don't know if this is the right idea or this is not going to mm-hmm. work, um, which thankfully did not happen. But it was very interesting to be able to send it out and to have someone's feedback that, yes, I do want to continue reading this. And that basic level was very motivating, I found, for me to keep going for the whole year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, also when you have, I found that when people have a deadline, you know, when somebody's waiting for it, but also what you said about your husband hasn't read it. My wife never reads my work either because she, you know, because she's not a professional really in, in, in editing and publishing. So people who are not professionals, why do they read? Well, they read it to get information and they read it or they read it for entertainment. So if something is not fully formed, then it's not going to be that entertaining. And it's also not going to be that informative. So, but editors know that something, editors are used to reading things, you know, pieces that are not completely finished. And an editor's job, as, um, you know, Scott Berg said in the Max Perkins um, biography, and he was Thomas Wolfe and... um, uh, and uh, Fitzgerald's editor in the 1920s. Uh, Perkins said that the job of the editor is to let, not to create anything, just to let light in, just to let more light in. So, you know, you're, you're looking for the potential of what's there and then helping the author to get more of it rather than what I think bad editors do is they have a, a, an idea of what a novel should be you know, based on maybe what's trending or what their experience of novels they've enjoyed. And then they they ask their authors to conform to that idea of what the novel should be. And I've actually worked with an editor or two professionally who had that idea, and it was a nightmare. You know, I think as an editor myself, I might not like a work I'm editing, but you should an editor should always be able to see the brilliance there, even if they don't like it even if it's not their cup of tea, because somebody out there will. I mean, not everybody likes oysters, you know? So True. what you're trying to do is is really help the author develop their voice, you know, in that magical arena where the reader can read and, fall, you know, fall into the story. And the, and the writer gives just enough to allow the reader to take the work and make it their own emotional experience. So at what point do you think people would want to think about working with an editor in the process of revision? I mean, I basically did because I had been working on this book for three years and I was like, I can't get any further without someone else's input. But I'm, I'm interested in sort of how far you go with your own editing process and having done this for quite some time. You know, when do you look for an input from an editor? Um, I actually am in a weird position where I desperately need an editor at the moment. Um, I, um, you know, I've worked with several editors over all the different books I've written. Um, and, um, you know, some give me more input than others. And I'm at a point now where I've been getting very, very little input, maybe two pages for a, for a whole book. And although that might seem like a dream, you know, because you don't have to make that many changes. It's actually a nightmare because as a writer, you constantly want to develop, even though it's painful, even though that sense of things being unfinished is horrible. <laughs> so, you know, I'm actually currently searching for, for an editor who, you know, I can work with who's going to say, Simon, look, this bit doesn't work and this is why, and this bit, you know, isn't going to work unless you change this. You know, I want someone who's really going to... Um, you know, get down into the trenches with me. Um, and, you know, with, I think, modern publishing, the idea is, is you know, especially in the U.S., is, is um, you know, the book has to have some kind of commercial appeal. 
I mean, I've lost count of how many editors have said to me, well, you know, if we put a commercial cover on this, it will. But it, in my experience, it always backfires because people who like commercial books are not going to be attracted to a literary work because of the cover. They'll start reading it and they'll immediately put it back. And then people who like literary works are not going to go for a commercial cover. So um, the idea of, I think, real editing is about making the book as, as good as it can be, regardless of, of you know, whether it fall, falls into any trends. And then after the book is done and the editor and the writer have done the best possible work, which is always a collaboration, then, you know, you can give it to the marketing department and say, how can we make, how can we, you know, yeah, how can we um, sort of uh, tap into the current veins of, of fashion or whatever's popular at the moment? Um, so that's the key, I think, is to find an editor who uh, it purely wants to develop the work in and of itself outside of um, commercial pressures. Yeah, I think so. Because I think that if you're thinking about the commercial prospects of a book, when you're thinking about the idea at the beginning, I mean, it's going to be years before you finish it and put it out. So whatever is trending now has really nothing to do with what it's going to be later. And and I also feel like that can be such a way to get paralyzed and from writing is thinking I mean, I have people ask questions sometimes like, well, where is this going to be on the shelf about an idea? And, oh, God, that's hard. Yeah, and that's hard it doesn't matter. It's not your job. Your job, I think, at least I believe as my writer, as a writer, my job is not to figure out where yeah. the book goes in the bookstore. No, that's exactly right. That's um, that's um, in my in my opinion, that's not even an editor's job. That's a publisher's job. You know, so the thing is, if you have a book that you know, you write and somebody buys it to publish it, um, then, you know, they're only buying the license to publish it um, for a certain amount of time. And then, so if they do that, and a lot of people sign off on it, and you get some nice reviews and bookstore owners like it, then you've done your job. If it doesn't sell, it's 100% not your fault. Um, and if, you know, because the thing is, the business of, of, of writing is so different from the actual craft of writing. I, and, you know, when I was younger, I was really involved in the business and I really wanted to, I, I really wanted to, um, I don't know, really, I suppose just get a lot of book sales and reach a lot of people. But the older I've gotten, the more, not so jaded, I suppose, but the more I realized that, um, creativity in the actual publishing of a book is not really welcomed. <laughs> um, you know, you want to find an editor fundamentally who would take a bullet for your book, somebody who really believes in it, um, you know, and it's more to them than just a job. You know, you don't want the sort of editor who at five o'clock you know, just wherever they are in the book, they just switch off the computer and go home. It's just a job to them because a book for you is not just a job unless you're, a, you know, a commercial writer and that's that's fine too. There's lots of good commercial books, but the kind of people I work with, the book is um, entertaining, of course, but it's more than that. It's somehow deeply nourishing. Like, you know, 10, 15 years from now, you know, you might still expect to run into the characters or when you read it again in 10 or 15 years, the book has a different meaning for you. Or it's the sort of book you would pass on 20 years from now to somebody and say, I think this is going to really help you. That, for me, that's the goal of writing is that intimate human connection. It's not so people can sit on the beach and escape. For me, that would be a nightmare. I'd give up, give it up and, you know, work at Costco or something. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's the, it's the idea that, you get a deeper experience of your life. You don't escape from it. But I think that most of the books that earn the big bucks are meant to distract people from their lives. Whereas the books I like and the books I edit um, are meant to give people a deeper experience of their lives. And that's hard because now, you know, we, we're competing with Netflix and, and streaming TV and film, which is good. A lot of content is excellent. But so you, you're, now you're writing literary books for a very special kind of person, somebody who 
craves that deep experience, that sensuality, that grittiness, that tension, and they crave it more than they want to be distracted and entertained. So in a way, now with literary fiction, you're reaching somebody who is very unique, and it's a real honor to have that kind of reader. Yes, I think so. And I think it's, I think that's the intimidating thing when you get to the point of, of revising, at least for me, is to, as you said, you've got the house built, but to decorate it and to put the atmosphere and life into it that I think mm. I felt when I first had the idea at the beginning, but to somehow bring that energy back into the space and to make someone else feel that way when they're reading it. Yeah, absolutely. And to, and also to, to have that book in the revision, a, a first draft is in some ways, um, you know, the writer telling the story to themselves or the writer impersonating a story. But in the second and third draft, it's when, it's when it really, really comes to life because you've got the structure now so you can really fine tune everything. Um, it's the best part. Once you've got the first draft done, I mean, the hard, the real hard work is over. Now it's, it's really good fun. It's like, I don't know if you've ever seen somebody restoring a car. But for hours and hours and hours, weeks and weeks, they're just hammering and welding. And you go out into the garage and it just looks like the same piece of shit they had, you know, six months ago when they brought it in on a trailer <laughs> covered in tarps, you know. And then you're like, what are they doing? That's the first draft. And then when you go out there and it's the wheels are on and it's that weird matte gray. And you're like, yeah, like the primer. And then you hear the engine start. Oh, you know, you could never take that car to a show. But you've really now got something to work with. You know, and the color and the, 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 the finish of the paint and the type of wheel and the type of headlamps, this is what gives the car personality. So now the first draft, you've got that vehicle, it works you've got the primer. This is when you make it yours. I think there's something where I've definitely experienced this and it happened really close to the end of finishing the draft. But I'm wondering if this is true for most people, but where you hit this really deep pit of despair and think this is not going to work. <laughs> And the, the intensity of the despair is in some ways relative to how close you are to the actual end of it. Because it was like less than a week later after I was having this crying fit at the dinner table with my husband saying, this is, a, I'm a fraud. This is a sham. This is not working. It's never going to happen. Um, and I'm sure that'll happen again at some point during the revision. But it felt like mm -hmm. that this is ne a necessary rite of passage to, to hit that point and then to keep going and, and continue anyway. Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, the thing is, when you, when it happens to you the first time, you know, you're shocked and you start to question the project. But, you know, when somebody has written, say, seven or eight, nine books, then they know it's coming. <laughs> they know that feeling is in the mail. Um, and, and you're just like, eh, you know, it'll it'll come. And then what you'll do is well, that's when the time to watch Netflix and to, like, relax and, and not to think about it. Because what will happen is um, when you're sick, you kind of imagine that you ran 10 miles you know, or that you did these things, you skied, you know, when you're really sick, you're like, you can't imagine ever having had the energy to leave the bed. But then when you're better, it's, it's like just walking around or walking to the shops it doesn't feel like it takes any energy. Well, I think it sounds like, you know, you can't imagine the book going well when it's not going well. And then when it works out, yes, it feels absolutely. like it was always going to work yeah. out. Yeah, I mean, but when you when the weight's going well, the book feels inevitable. Yeah. But remember this, you're creating something from absolutely nothing. You're creating a world, characters, scenes, appetites, desires, disappointments, even grief, that before you started writing, it didn't exist in the world. Well, it did, but not in this way. So you've created this entire world from nothing. And that's really, that's really something miraculous. And so the problem is, though, um, when you go into it, if there's in a first draft, there's going to be lots of inconsistencies which break that spell. 
of being that other world. And that's disconcerting because it feels amateurish. So when you look through a first draft, you're like, oh, God, I'm such an amateur. You know, like, oh, that sentence is banal. Um, but that's good because, you know, if you know that, then you'll change it. But the thing is, you've finished a first draft and you, you're supposed to feel like you've accomplished something. But the problem is it doesn't really feel like that. Um, you know, and also it's very hard to get hold of first drafts of books. So, for instance, um, The End of the Affair by Graham Greene um, or um, Charlotte's Web, you know, the children's book. If you could see a first draft of those books, you'd be shocked at how different they are to the final draft. Um, yes. You know, it, it, but writers, nobody wants to show those to anybody. <laughs> Well, that tells you something. Yeah, like I'd rather die than have anyone see this draft. Yeah, I think William Burroughs said he would put first drafts in other people's trash cans. <laughs> of course, because, you, yeah, you don't want anyone thinking, oh, my God, who wrote that sentence with the same word in it three times? Yeah, there's, um, there's a book called The Original, Original of Laura by Nabokov, and that's an unfinished book. That was published posthumously. Now, if you buy that book, it's definitely worth getting. Um, it shows you basically an unfinished book by Nabokov, a first draft of a book. And it's so terrible. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, so, it's so bad that you realize, oh, I get it now. You know what I mean? So the, the origin of Laura would eventually have been like Nabokov's other books, brilliant, maze-like, you know, um, funny, um, grim in a, in a sort of, uh, in a, in a, you know, Nabokov's such a bizarre and wonderful writer, an interesting writer. Um, and so to see a first draft of a book of his is great. So I encourage people to get that book, um, the original of Laura, because it's one of the only examples of a published first draft. Um, yeah, and no you can see, then, you know, we're not the only ones. There was one, I think, and it's impossible to get now, but there was an issue of, um, I think, Dave Eggers magazine that had um, somebody's first draft in it. I think it was Michael... Chavon, maybe. He had a book that oh. he tried and tried and tried and he couldn't make it work. I feel like it was Michael Chavon. Mm. And he um, he let them publish either part or most of it in um, one of the magazines. But of course, it was like limited edition, those beautiful editions that they do. And now yeah. you can't get it. It's like hundreds and hundreds of dollars to get a copy of it. So I have never seen it. But I did hear about this elusive published first draft that was a section of this book mm. that wasn't working. And I've been dying to see it ever since. Mm, interesting. Interesting. You can also get The Crack Up by F. Scott Fitzgerald, which is a collection of unfinished pieces. Ooh, okay. That's good as well. And that's good because when you read it, you think, oh, God, this is terrible. But then you realize it's from this that the fires of genius. This, this, is, this is the fire from which F. Scott Fitzgerald was. This is the fire from which The Great Gatsby and um, This Side of Paradise, I think. Is that the title? I were, think so, yeah. Were forged. Yeah. Because Fitzgerald's early work is so overwritten. And it's like, oh, you know, this is not good at all. It's, it's sort of Victorian and scandalous, you know, you know. But then when you when you realize that if the, the difference between Fitzgerald's early short stories and The Great Gatsby is the difference of an editor, basically. Because I, I wrote a nonfiction piece on F. Scott Fitzgerald's short stories, um, which I didn't really enjoy. Um as much as I enjoy his, his novels. And that's because he, that was before he, I think, you know, that was before Max Perkins really edited the great Gatsby. I mean, really edited it. Um, just in the same way that Gary Fish could have edited Raymond Carver. So if you ever see a first draft of a Raymond Carver story with Gary's crossings out, it's amazing how much an editor can impact, you know, a finished draft. 
I mean, it's the every writer I know really, really desires a deep, intimate, professional relationship with an editor that is becoming rarer and rarer as money becomes, you know, publishing and fortune is becoming a bit like Hollywood, you know, where it's a lot of franchises. And, you know, it's just, um, the, you know, Knight Rider 16, <laughs> you know, as opposed to... As opposed to, you know, a film about somebody getting water from a well over 20 years, something like that, you know. So, um, yeah, all the writers I know, from the best-selling authors to the indie writers who have a more esoteric way of creating their work, we all create, crave that relationship with that professional editor. And do you um, feel that you don't get the time, or are they expecting you to bring a draft to them that doesn't need an editor? at a certain point? Well, I mean, the thing is, it depends on the, on the editor, really. There's a lot of really, really great editors out there. Um, but, you know, they, I think that they feel so much pressure to make their numbers, mm. you know. Um, and, um, you yeah, know, for instance, I was having lunch with a, with a, uh, a writer whose books have sold in, in Europe literally millions of copies. And he said that um, he wants a relationship with an, ed an editor where, you know, if, if a pipe bursts in the night, he can call his editor and say, a pipe's burst. There's water <laughs> everywhere. What should I do? And the editor will be like, I'm coming over. I'm coming over. And um, as opposed to what he has, which is where, you know, twice a year, he goes to a very corporate style restaurant. They all sit down in, in like, you know, casual business casual and it's very kind of corporate right um so you know none of the writers i, I mean n writers don't get into this business to make money and a lot of writers i know could have been terrific physicians or or lawyers you know but we got into it because of our passion for telling stories and we want our publisher and our editor ref to reflect that passion not to have that passion weakened by the need to make someone money that will never even meet Right. That's bullshit. I mean, I'm tired of that. And I think a lot of writers are getting tired of that. Yeah, it almost feels like, I mean, to use the physician metaphor, it's like when you go to the doctor and you only get like two minutes with someone before they have to be shoved on to move to someone else. It sounds like there's a feeling like that. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, then you get, pres I mean, uh, medication works. I, you know, I know from personal experience and relatives. I mean, but but to have medication as the first, you know, not, well, let's talk about your lifestyle. Let's talk about just to treat the symptoms solely, you know, for, you know, do you see what I mean? Yep. Like some, some doctors, none that I know, actually, I know all the doctors I know are very um, careful people and thoughtful people, but I've heard stories where some doctors will just be with you for compliments and I'll just prescribe something. You know, I mean, maybe they know. I mean, I'm not a doctor, but I'm a little no, suspicious. No, am I. <laughs> you know. But um, I think it would know, feel the same way habits, if, an, if you had an editor who was like, oh, you just need to make it like this, or you need this kind of ending, or you need to have this sort of thing. It's mm -hmm. like, fit it mm -hmm. into a trope. Yeah. That's exactly the problem. And, um, and also that's been worsened by the political correctness movement, which, of course, has excellent ideals because you know as someone who was outcast in britain you know because my mother's you know not british and so i experienced everything that political correctness has tried to remedy but now i think it's gone too far mm. you know um i mean just in my personal experience as someone who believes in in all the ideals of the, of what political correctness has tried to achieve you know by leveling the playing field all the inclusivity that we need and absolutely must have, you know, to have a good society. But some of the things now that are being flagged, it, to me, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and a lot, of, uh, a lot of writers I know feel that way too. Well, I think it's just interesting as the, as the whole industry changes and, you know, how people can, can make something that they feel has meaning to it and isn't, you know, a widget or a commodity that people want to buy, which right. I think seems to be what's happened to film. Yeah, absolutely. And also, you know, is this work going to lead to a lawsuit? You know, is this work 
um, going to cause controversy. You know, if you look at the best books, you know, Ulysses and Lady Chatterley's Lover, you know, and Wuthering Heights, they cause controversy and they're some of the best books. Um, but, you know, when editors start telling writers, you can't write about this subject, you know, it really starts to limit the imagination. And I really think, you know, so it's a kind of, um, it's a kind of censorship in a way. Yeah, I think um, that making a subject off limits is always going to be a problem. But like doing it with integrity is the is the point, not to avoid doing it at yeah, all. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's very clear. I mean, as a as a as a, a writer and an editor, it's very clear when I read something that lacks that integrity, where the person obviously has an axe to grind, you know, politically or with class or with race or something like that. Um, that's it's obvious to me. Um, and then when I read a book that treats a subject with with sensitivity and compassion and kindness, it doesn't matter who wrote it. What matters is that this light has entered the world and people will learn from it and the world will be better. So the idea of telling people they they're not qualified to write about something, you know, I, I think is is it's tricky. I can understand why editors would say this, you know, um, but it's it's tricky, you know. Yeah, I think it is. And I think it's one of those things that you have to ask about when you're in a second draft. Like, is this working? Am I doing this right? Am I handling it this Am I handling this well and responsibly? Not, oh, this doesn't look exactly like my life, so I have to cut it out. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, and one way to, to to that's certainly true. Yeah, and one way to, to figure that out is ask yourself: Am I writing this with any kind of anger? Because then, if you are, it's usually a bad idea. But if you're writing out of out of a kind of I don't know, a sort of um, um, a sort of compassion, I think. A, you know, a sort of empathy, a generosity. If you're writing from there, an editor later on will, will say, you know, this this may be, you know, you may not have intended it to be insensitive, but it is in this way. You know, and then a writer usually will listen because if that wasn't their intention, they certainly don't want to, you know, to be that way. So, you know, writers usually listen to their editors. And um, But um, for editors to say you can't even mention this subject, I think is is, uh, well, I mean, it's only really in the U.S. Um, that this is happening. Yeah. Um, you know, because, of course, you know, as we saw in Victorian England, with the obsession with immorality, you know, about being moral, it was to mask massive immorality beneath the, beneath the curtain of society. So here, you know, people are obsessed with, with you know, equality because beneath the surface of American society, there's massive inequality. Yeah, and nobody's willing to talk about that. Yeah, the things that, that you know, yeah, it's true. It's it's true. No one's willing to talk about that. There's an enormous amount of hypocrisy, you know. For instance, um, you know, America, I think, is the biggest exporter of pornography. Yet no one mentions that, you know, or no one mentions misogyny in popular music, you know, and things like that. So, you know, it's very easy to point the finger, but... But um, so not to get um, dragged into that kind of nest of, of vipers, <laughs> my advice to the writer is just just be, be authentic and don't, don't question your, unless you're writing out of anger or revenge or something like that, which is always a terrible idea, um, you know, because then my advice is to just be true to the story and to the characters um, and if you don't have any experience of people or certain character situations, go live there, go spend time there, um, you know, and, and learn. And, um, and that also, you know, Mark Twain said that travel is fatal to racism. And, um, you know, because when you go somewhere and you meet people, you realize, oh, actually we're quite similar, you know, and, um, so that that's my advice, to so stay true to the story. And then, you know, later on, um, later on, you can, um, an editor will maybe talk to you, help you adapt it or something. I, I wrote a, 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 a novella about a Chinese family 
living in a working class area in Beijing. And my Chinese, my Mandarin is elementary. Um, so I wrote it in English initially. And, um, and I was worried that people would say, oh, you know, you, you didn't grow up in a working class part of Beijing. So, and you're not Chinese. I mean, I'm a, I think I'm, a, I'm an eighth Chinese, but I'm not Chinese enough where, you know, it, I'm clearly an Asian writer. So I was worried about that. But the book actually has been selling really well in China. And um, the Chinese don't mind that somebody from the West would write as a Chinese character. They think it's quite a good idea because it allows you to try and experience what it's like to be in a different culture and see it from their point of view, which is what I tried to do. Um, they're not at all. I mean, obviously, the relationship between Britain and China has been problematic because of the colonial period and the Opium War and things like that. But um, so for them, it wasn't a problem. And I think in the US, I, I had to, you know, some of the book was published in a Chinese magazine. So that went at the front of the book and said, you know, this book, an extract of this book was published in a Chinese magazine. So at least people can't say, well, Chinese people will be offended because obviously they're not. So um, my, but all through the writing of that book, I had this lingering fear that this book isn't going to get published because I'm impersonating um, a Chinese person. But I didn't see it like that. You see, I was just telling a story from the point of view of a character that I met in a hutong in Beijing that I felt connected to and I fell in love with. And I wanted to tell his story, even though people will say, well, it's not your right to tell his story. But he doesn't mind. And the Chinese don't mind. And the people in the hutong didn't mind. Um, so I didn't know. It's, uh, but I do understand that whole idea of cultural ventriloquism. Um, you know, but uh, so it's 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 hard to. I think every book has to be based on an judge on an individual basis, really. Definitely. Um, but you don't want to limit your imagination. I mean, the end the end goal is you don't want to spread bigotry, you know, or hatred. You want to spread love. You know, you want to have a story that people emotionally engage to, and it makes their lives better and the people around them better. You know, so. I think that um, you stay true to the story and to your vision of what the story should be and don't ever worry about publishing or what people will say, you know, feedback, negative or positive. Because somebody might be writing about, um, you know, say, say about Syrian, about refugees. And, you know, the book, they're thinking when they're writing it, this book will really open up people's eyes to what it's like to be a refugee in Calais, you know, the border, the French border, you know. And uh, But then that's a real distraction. So anticipating positive or negative feedback is a huge distraction from the actual creative act. And you should just serve the work. So instead of thinking, what will people think of it? Just try and stay as much as possible inside the characters, inside the book. So you get the authenticity of the story. So then in the end, when people read it, whether they hate it or love it, it doesn't matter because you made the most authentic, truest possible novel you could make that was possible for you to make. You know, imagine if you change everything based on what you think people are going to say, then you don't have a book that is completely a reflection of your talent. And then, people don't like it anyway. So it was sort of a waste. Yeah. Um, the, be the best chefs, they make food that they think is delicious. It's the best possible thing they can make. You know, they don't ask themselves, will people like this? They don't give a shit if people like it because they know that it's good ingredients. They know, they trust in what they're doing. So you have to have an enormous amount of, of faith in the story and in the integrity of the story. I think that's I think that's really the most important thing to do in the second draft is to you figure out what the story is and I think it's true in the first draft I felt like I was telling the story to figure out what happened for me and then in the second draft yeah. you figure out if you've done it properly if you've done it well enough that everything that comes across that's meant to come across is going to come across. Yeah, you see and you're you're easy to work with in that way because because you're always open to 
to change. I mean, um, I mean, also you're, I mean, you're quite a special person. I mean, you just moved from LA to Berlin. That's a very big move, I and mean, that's very difficult in some ways, you know, to have that kind of transition. But I see that also reflected in your in the way you work as a writer. Like, you know, you're willing to put up with uncertainty and and some element of hardship and cultural difference. You know, you're willing to go through that in order to have a a different experience of life. So your willingness so. to, to move and to travel is also reflected in your in your skills as a writer. I think, um, yeah. But and and also you, were, I was able to really to really um, be efficient with you because I didn't have to preface any criticism or suggestion with something. You know, I didn't have to cushion anything. I could just say this bit. You know would work better maybe if you think about the, you know, I can actually just say things. So I was able to, I think we were able to get more done, um, which tells me that you have a lot of confidence um, in the story and in the, in the work. And that tells me also that you're going to see it through to the end because you have that confidence from the beginning. Thank you. So you, you were, you were, you were very, you were, we got a lot done. We covered a lot of ground. Um, because of your fearlessness with changing bits and rearranging things and being open, you know, to new uh, angles. However, I will say that, um, that I lie, did like when you, when, you know, you were going in one direction and it felt wrong and you said, no, that's it. I'm cutting that. I'm going back to this. And I like that you had, you knew enough about your story where you knew that just wasn't going to work and you didn't want to continue with it. Yeah, um, that think, was with the flashbacks. Yes. I was just like, oh, no, 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 no. This is a completely different book. Um, yeah, ex- absolutely. Now, another, say I'm working with another writer and they're like, no, no, that definitely, mm, how can I put this? If they did use the flashbacks in their work, you know, for them it might work, but it all depends. It's about matching the style with the writer. Um, so could you have written a good book with the flashbacks? Sure, but it wouldn't have been your book. And that's the key, is the book has to be a reflection of your vision. And that's why the imagination, you know, not only needs to be let loose, but you also need to sometimes say, no, this isn't working, and then sort of rechannel your imagination. Yeah. Well, it's been so helpful to have your input and I'm I'm really happy that we were able to have this conversation to share with others because I've gotten so much out of the conversations that we've had about story structure and moving forward and and revising that I wanted to make sure that others were able to benefit as well so thank you so so much for taking the time to come back on oh it's a pleasure sorry for cursing (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, no need to apologize. Okay. We, we are we are pro cursing on this show. Okay, <laughs> thank goodness. Thank you so much for listening to the Secret Library podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this week's show. You can keep the conversation going by leaving a comment in the show notes at secretlibrarypodcast.com or visit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash secretlibrarypodcast. You can also connect directly with me on Twitter or Instagram where I'm Caro Donahue. That's at C-A-R-O-D-O-N-A-H-U-E. I look forward to chatting with you there. See you next week. Until then, happy writing.